Hey, g'day, it's Prezzo here. This is the final episode of the Stuart No. 8 mill engine build. In this episode, we're going to assemble the complete engine, and then the most important part, we're going to test run it at the end on compressed air. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a steam boiler that I can access to do this, so compressed air will have to do. So, this is going to be done as sort of a time-lapse montage with a little bit of commentary thrown in. But uh, for now, let's just get busy and start assembling. Okay, I'm going to be perfectly honest with you here. This is a part that I've not been looking forward to doing. I've had a couple of trial runs at fitting these piston rings and each time I sort of chickened out and decided that I'll leave it till later. So I have never done this on an engine this size before, so I don't know what to expect. If I break them, you're going to hear some bad language, I guarantee it. So I'm guessing the idea is that you put the free end in the gap or at least in the groove of the piston and then you've got to slowly work your way around feeding it into the gap as you go hopefully so you don't don't open this break between the piston and piston ring ends too much because that's what's going to put stress on the ring okay it seems to be going but oh ping and it goes brilliant uh, second one it sort of fits in the gap, so that's all right. This one's going to be a little bit more of a problem because it sort of goes in on an angle and doesn't want to fit in the gap quite as neatly as the other one. You see there it's quite crooked. Ping, 
in it goes. That's not as bad as I thought it was going to be. And they spin quite freely, so it's, it's the actual expansive pressure against the side of the cylinder that does the sealing, so... Okay, all good. So one of the jobs I need to do on this engine as I assemble it this time is to actually fit all of the packing and the, the gland sealing around the moving parts like the piston rod and the valve rod. So in this particular instance what we do is put the piston rod through the bottom cylinder cover. No we don't. We put it through the gland nut first and then into the bore or the bottom cylinder cover and then it's just a matter of wrapping this material around the piston rod. Now I bought this material from a uh, model engineer supplier. Uh, it's sold as valve packing. I believe that it was at one time asbestos string which was impregnated with graphite and grease and the graphite and the grease gave the lubrication and the asbestos string was soft and would pack into the cavity and the gland nut was then used to build up pressure on that material and it gave some uh, adjustment as well so after a period of time you could tighten up the gland nut and any uh, steam that was leaking from that joint could be eliminated so I don't know if this is still made from asbestos it's probably just some sort of natural fiber uh, the graphite and the grease would prevent any of that uh, asbestos fiber from becoming loose and escaping anyway so I'm not too worried about it interesting story when I was uh, teaching there was a school uh, about an hour's drive north of me and uh, at the time they were doing an audit on all of the schools and trying to find out where the asbestos was in these buildings some of these were uh, built back in the 1950s and they used asbestos on the roofs and in the underfloor uh, material underneath the linoleum. This particular day the auditors came in and they started to peel up the lino and uh, the first thing they saw was some letters and it read ASBE and immediately they locked down the, uh, the building, they put up barricades, they got a hazmat team in and a disposal team uh, the area was out of bounds for uh, the rest of the week and no students were able to enter the building. When they finally pulled up the lino from the floor, they saw, saw the words asbestos-free underlay. So all of that panic and all of that work and the material was asbestos-free anyway. So it's a funny old world, isn't it? Anyway, we've got this gland nut sort of reasonably tight now and that's moving and it will free up as the engine runs in a bit. So we can now assemble the bottom cylinder cover and insert the end of the connecting rod into the crosshead.
I've got to get two washers and two nuts onto these studs in the little tiny space between the end of the casting and this flange here. So I'm not going to show it on camera because I guarantee it's going to get messy, it's going to take me forever. So just trust me, I'll put the parts on there and then we'll show the final cranking of the spanner. Well, they did go on, but not without a fight. I ended up using a pair of surgical forceps. Lots of swear words, lots of fiddling, a bit of disassembly, but I eventually got it. So let's tighten these bad boys up. Um, by the way, I am using washers underneath all these uh, hex fasteners just so I don't damage the powder coat. I feel like I should explain at this point why these steam ports look so raggedy. Back in one of the early episodes uh, when I was looking at machining the cylinder I was talking about how little clearance there was on these parts and how little machining allowance I had and one of the issues was that the steam ports were cast in so the makers had used very fine cores uh, to bring these ports through to the inside of the cylinder and when I had a look, these uh, ports were meant to be 3 seconds of an inch wide. This is a 3 32nd inch drill bit, and as you can see, they just fall into the port. And I haven't machined these at all. They were exactly as they were when I got the casting. So if I had tried to machine that port to clean up the edges, it would have ended up being oversized. Now, the engine will run with the ports the way they are. And even if I were to machine the bigger, the, the engine would still run. Either way, it's not going to produce its full 100% efficiency. Uh, and when I say 100% efficiency, I mean for an engine in perfect condition. Steam engines were notoriously inefficient compared to modern diesel engines and electric motors and so on. But the fact that these edges are not completely straight means that when the slide valve slides over that and begins to expose the edge of the port then a small segment of the port will become available to the steam or the compressed air before the rest of the port so you tend to get a sort of a leakage into the port so what that means is that uh, the engine will not have that really crisp beat 
uh, when you hear a, a like a well-maintained steam engine running under load, it will have this very distinctive crack from the exhaust and a very distinctive uh, note from the, the power strokes in the, the cylinder. So I'm not going to get that. And uh, does it matter? Probably not. Um, so I'm going to leave this as they are. Like I say, they're a tiny bit oversized and they're not completely straight, but the engine is going to function just the same. So I'm going to go ahead and get the rest of the studs in and get the valve uh, chest on, but I can't put the cover on until I've done the setting of the slide valve and the position of the eccentric. Oh, and by the way, uh, in terms of full disclosure, you might be wondering why that hole is bigger than the one down here. Very early on in the construction, I snapped off a 7BA tap in that hole and I had to grind it out and make a special stud. So this one has a 5BA thread on one end and a 7BA thread on the other. And it was the only way I was going to rescue that part. So um, yeah, if it looks odd, it is. But it was either that or scrapped the part and I had no replacement, so I didn't want to do that. So here's our gasket. Okay, now the steam chest goes on and then we have to set the slide valve. So in fact it comes off again. So I'm just going to let that sit there loose uh, while I do all the setting of the valve. Okay, so there are two components to setting the valve. First of all, we need to temporarily put the eccentric on and the eccentric strap. And then you need to set the position of the slide valve so, so it has an even amount of stroke. And then the second part is to set the angular position of the eccentric. And at this point, you can decide whether you want the engine to run clockwise or anti-clockwise. Okay, that'd be right. I put that on the wrong way around. Damn it. Okay, so that's got the eccentric sheath on the crankshaft, but it's all loose at this stage. So the first step is just to temporarily clamp the eccentric sheath to the crankshaft and then set the angular position, or sorry, set the, the length of stroke in the valve. So as you rotate the crankshaft, you just got to look at how much of the steam port's being exposed at either end of the slide valve. If it's not right, you need to take out the screw, rotate the valve rod, and that will move the valve rod up and down in the nut. And you can only really set this with sort of like a half a turn of the thread. But um, eventually you will get roughly the same amount of travel at both ends of the valve. So at this stage, I'm getting more at this end. Here, so I've got the whole of the the port exposed, but at this end I've only got a tiny bit, so I need to move the valve that way. So that screw comes out, and we just simply wind the valve rod back a few turns, and you just keep doing that till you get it right. Okay, so not sure if you can see that, but so 
So I'm sort of getting the whole of the port exposed at that end. And probably a little bit more than the full port at that end. So I can afford to go sort of like half a turn toward the top cylinder cover. So that's that way. Okay, so if we're happy with the position of the slide valve, now we need to set the angular position of the eccentric. So with the engine on, say, top dead center, you can then rotate the eccentric so the top port is just about to be uncovered. So I've just replaced that M3 grub screw with a 3 millimeter um, metal thread screw, just so I can get some torque on that. Okay, so what I'm looking for at this end now is just the very edge of the port to be exposed by the slide valve. Now depending on which way I go, that will determine which way the engine rotates. Now I don't know which way a prototype of this engine would rotate, so it really doesn't matter. But I'm just looking through now and I can just see the port appearing. So that would be the correct angular position for the slide valve and the eccentric. So I'm going to take out this screw and I'll put the grub screw back in and we'll tighten it down to that point. So I'm thinking, just trying to imagine here, I think that's going to rotate uh, clockwise seen from the driven end of the crankshaft, I think. And you might be thinking, hang on, three millimeters I thought all of these fasteners were 7BA and 5BA well yes there was a 7BA grub screw in this eccentric but it had a slotted head and it was almost impossible to get enough torque on that grub screw to tighten it down to the crankshaft without damaging the screw so I just replaced it with an M3 socket head screw it makes it a lot easier to set So once I've tightened down these nuts, I can go ahead and do the final tightening up of the eccentric sheath just so that the angular alignment of the eccentric rod is correct in relation to the, the valve rod. So let me get some washers for these. Okay, well that takes care of most of the engine. Uh, the one remaining thing to go on now is the displacement lubricator, this T-piece and the steam inlet pipe. I'm not going to fit that just yet though because I want to run this on air to show you and none of these fittings here will accept the quick release coupling on my compressed air line. So I'm going to leave that for now and uh, we'll run the engine. The next thing I have to do though is get this attached to the timber base. Now. When I made this timber base, I had to take into account the fact that the engine is the full width of the crankshaft or the full length of the crankshaft, and I had to also allow for the cylinder as well. And this steel rule is exactly 25 millimeters wide, so I'm going to offset from this end at 25 and from the front of the timber block 25 millimeters as well. There's a little bit more offset at this end, but there's a bigger bulk of material at this end as well, so that's going to help the mass to look centered. 
and I'm going to fix this down to the timber base with these round head nickel plated wood screws. Now in a prototype or a full size engine this would be probably grouted into a stone floor using studs and hex head bolts but this is a display model so I'm not going to get too hung up about full size practice uh, on this timber base. I also just realized that I cannot get a drill bit at this pair of holes underneath the cylinder here so I'm going to have to unbolt the engine from its base, I'll get that fixed down and then we'll put the engine back on again. Okay, that was just me being pedantic there, uh, doing a process called heading the screws, trying to get all the slots running the same way. Alright, here's my brass plate and I want to just centre that on the front of this block. And uh, the easiest way to centre it is just simply push it right down one end, flush with that end, measure the difference. So in this case it's 193 and you just halve that and that becomes your offset from one end. So it's sort of, uh, it's always some stupid measurement when you want to halve it. It's never like 80 or 200. So I think that's 90, what did I say it was? Pay attention. 193, so it's 96 and a half. And I'm just going to put a bit of tape there to mark my position. And on the back of this, I've just put a little bit of double sided tape just to hold it in place while I get the holes drilled. Right, that's just barely holding, that tape's very thin. So I reckon that looks okay. So I'm just going to, I'm actually using uh, escutcheon pins, which are like little round headed brass nails. So I'm just going to sort of temporarily, or at least partially, drill this just to get the nails a chance to start. Go back on. Now I'm not going to pretend to you and say that I haven't run this engine already, of course I have. I've spent many days running it, stripping it down, fixing problems, putting it back together again. One of the last things I had to do was take the flywheel off and re-machine the bore of the flywheel. For whatever reason I got the bore just a little bit on the loose side. Every time I tighten up the grub screw I ended up with a bit of a, a wobble in the, the flywheel and I reckon nothing looks worse than a model engine with a flywheel that doesn't run true. So I spent a couple of hours this morning machining a stainless steel bush, pressing it in, uh, re-machining the rim, doing a lot of work on that to get it looking good. So anyway, knowing already that this engine runs smoothly, let's just couple it up and see how we go.
So just to finish the engine off, I have fitted the displacement lubricator and the T on top of the valve chest and the inlet uh, pipe as well. Runs very nicely on air. Uh, it would certainly sound better running on steam and all and certainly better uh, running under a load. Steam engines don't like running just uh, freely without a load on them. Uh, they, they have that really distinctive exhaust beat when they've got something to drive. But um, overall, I'm really happy with the, the quality of the build. The, um, the finished engine looks nice. Uh, it's going to make a nice display piece. So uh, to my good friend John and also to his dad Keith, I hope you enjoy this engine. Uh, it's certainly been a lot of fun and a bit of a challenge also uh, getting this finished. So um, if you've been watching along, I hope you've enjoyed this series. And for now, thanks for watching.